Just wanted to give you a sneak peek into what our studio looks like before we start Bible study. You thought it was something grand. It's three lights, a couch, a computer with notes, a timer, and the all-important water. All right, praise God. Let's start Bible study. Hey there, everybody. It's good to see you. This is Pastor Robinson from Harvest Church of Hampton bringing you Harvest at Home Bible study. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that little intro. I wanted to give you some, some insight, some, some background into what it looks like, uh, into what we're doing in our Bible study, how we're setting it up. It's not a grand operation, but do you know what I want to focus on? I want to focus on bringing you this word and bringing it to you clean and clear so that everyone can be blessed. But I just thought that you might enjoy that. You ready to get into Bible study tonight? How about if you grab your Bibles, get your family together, let's get comfortable, and let's get started. Uh, we are blessed. We have been in a series on the Gospel of Matthew made simple. The Gospel of Matthew made simple. I hope you've been enjoying it. It has been such a blessing so far. We're making our way through the chapters uh, one by one, sometimes two at a time. But uh, tonight I want to talk to you from the subject temptation is not the problem. Temptation is not the problem, okay? That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Do me a favor. If you are watching on YouTube, not Ustream, but if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the like button and hit the subscribe button so that you can get the notifications and hit the notification bell. Also, if you'd like to connect, be sure to just text the word connect to 847-5277 with the area code 757. And you can also text the word join if you're thinking about joining Harvest Ministry. So that's what I wanted to start with. Now, let's do our memory verse. I, I want to encourage you. We have a new memory verse this week, a brand new memory verse. Our new memory verse comes from Hebrews, the second chapter and the 18th verse. Don't forget, our, our former memory verse was Matthew 4 and 4. We have a new memory verse, Hebrews 2 and 18. We're going to put it on the screen for you as we say it. Hebrews 2 and 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. Tempted. He is able to secure them that are tempted. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Amen. Hebrews 2 and 18. I want you to begin to commit that to memory. Hide it in your long-term memory so the Lord can bless you, he can keep you, and he can bring it to you when you need it. Amen? All right. Let's go before the Lord in prayer tonight. Or, yeah, tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we give you glory. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, every hearer tonight, I want you to send the Spirit of God out, right out on your word. Bless us. Keep us and heal us. We give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, we say amen and amen, amen. All right. So what's the title again? Temptation is not the problem. Now, I know because you're such a good student, you have already read well past chapter three, well past chapter four. You should be in five, six or seven by now. But this is from chapter four, okay? So, so you're going to be blessed because you've already done the reading. So I want to, keep, want to remind you, keep reading ahead so that you uh, can get the most out of the Bible studies and out of the Sunday sermons, all right? Now, uh, don't forget our background. Don't forget that we've talked about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. We talked about what we learned, how his parents were warned by an angel. And so they had to harbor him in Egypt for quite some time. So now you have this baby Jesus being harbored in Egypt. The angel comes back and says, the man that was seeking Jesus's life is dead. You can move back now. But instead of moving into Jerusalem or into Judea, they move into a town called what everybody? It starts with an inn, a town called Nazareth. That's right. And somehow miraculously, Jesus maintains his anonymity for 30 years. No one knows who he is for 30 years. But then one day Jesus is walking and he's recognized by John the Baptist. And in John, the first chapter, John holds his hand up and he says, behold, 
the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, John baptizes Jesus in the river Jordan, and you know what happens. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. The Holy Spirit wasn't a dove, but like a dove, and it announces, or not it, but God the Father announces who his son is. And what does he say, everybody? God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus the Messiah, the, the savior of the world is officially on the scene. Okay, so now keep this in mind. After being anointed by God, after the Holy Spirit has descended upon him and now he's been endued with power from on high, you would think that the first thing Jesus would do is to preach some mighty sermon or to work some mighty miracle so that everybody at this baptism can see who he really is. But do you know why we would think that? <laughs> that's because that's how man thinks. That's just how we think. We, we just think, well, we have all this power now. The power of God is in us. It's working through us. And now it's time to really show people what we can do. But thank God his ways are not our ways. Thank God his thoughts are not our thoughts. Thank God that's not how he operates, right? Because in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm, you have to know that an anointing, an anointing is always followed by temptation. Come on and take that in. An anointing is always followed by temptation. In other words, it's always followed by a testing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Some of you are in a test right now. I can hear some of you saying, well, Pastor Rob, I think I'm in my second test because I failed the first one. Listen, I've been there. I've done that. But an anointing is always followed by a testing because God wants to know not if you can receive the power. He wants to know if you can handle the power. He wants to know if he can trust you to be faithful with an anointing. Mm faithful with an anointing. He wants you to be faithful with his power. Can he trust you to be faithful with the very thing that does not belong to you? And that would be his power. Can he trust us? Can he trust us? So I want to look at a couple of things tonight concerning Jesus. Number one, I want to look at temptation because of course we're talking about temptation is not the problem. So first thing let's talk about temptation. Uh, I want you to see that after being anointed, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. This is Matthew, the fourth chapter, tempted in the wilderness. Let's look at Matthew 4, verses 1 and 2. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. So keep in mind, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was led by the Spirit. I point that out because of this. You have to remember that it's, everything's not the devil, right? Jesus was led into the, to the wilderness by the Spirit. It doesn't say he was led by the devil, right? Everything is not always the devil. Every circumstance is not the devil. Every challenge is not the devil. Every misunderstanding, every difficulty, every miscommunication is not always the devil. Some things in your life have been arranged by God to teach you, yes, you, a lesson. They've been arranged to teach you a lesson because God wants to see, can you learn something from that experience? Hmm. Somebody say, everything's not the devil. No, ma'am, no, sir. Everything is not the devil. Let's go back to verses one and two. Verse one says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Okay, all right. So keep in mind, we just came out of a water baptism for Jesus. John the, bapti John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And I want you to see that Jesus, through water baptism, he identifies with sinners. He's using that experience. He, he's not baptized because he himself has committed any sins or, or because he needs to repent of anything. He's identifying with sinners. But after identifying 
with sinners through his baptism, Jesus then identifies with the sinner again through having severe temptation. I wonder how many of you out there have ever experienced severe temptation. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the temptation that makes you sweat. I'm talking about the temptation that makes your stomach curl. I'm talking about the temptation that you don't want anyone to know about. Severe temptation. But you have to know that the temptation that Jesus experienced, no matter how severe, was a necessary part of his ministry. Because remember, some lessons can only be learned through certain experiences. Don't forget that. I I want you to know that there, there was a remarkable contrast between the glory that followed Jesus after water baptism and the challenge of actually being tempted by the devil. Right? Do you understand? So think about this. Water baptism. Cool waters of the Jordan. Now being tempted of the devil, he's, it's a barren, he's barren in the wilderness. Water baptism had huge crowds. Now Jesus is faced with solitude and confinement and silence. Water baptism, the spirit comes down and rests on him like a dove. But now the spirit drives him out into the wilderness. Water baptism, the voice of the father saying, "Uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But now we have Satan whispering in Jesus's ear, trying to tempt him. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Water baptism. He was anointed, but now he's being attacked. Water baptism. He 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 then. Uh, When he experienced the water baptism, now you see Jesus is experiencing the fire of temptation, right? You have the water of baptism and the fire of temptation. In water baptism, the heavens were opened. And in the temptation in the wilderness, hell was opened. And every demon tried, uh, and and the demon, the main demon, uh, Satan, the angel, he tried to tempt Jesus. All right. So I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see that. But you may say, well, um, why did Jesus need to be tempted? Um, Well, you know, it's not because he had committed any sin. And it really wasn't to help Jesus grow. You know, sometimes we're tempted to teach us lessons and to help us grow. But rather, Jesus endured the temptation so he could identify with you and I. Right. So he could he could understand. So he could understand what we were going through. He wanted to demonstrate his own holy character and his integrity uh, to the Lord. I want you to look at Hebrews 2 and 18, which is our memory verse. And notice that it says, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Because he was tempted, he can comfort or succor us who are also tempted. And then as I've quoted in other Bible studies, Hebrews 4 and 15, what does that say? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without what? That's right, yet without sin, all right? So why then does the scripture say that Jesus had to be tempted of the devil? That's a great question to ask. Because he had to be tempted of the devil, one part is because the Holy Spirit in God cannot tempt us. That's what the Bible says. The the Bible says in James, Um, that let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. He doesn't tempt any man with evil. So the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, does that make sense? God doesn't tempt man. All right. So now I want you to understand Temptation is no respecter of persons. It is a certainty for everyone. Everyone's going to experience temptation. But Jesus's temptation was more severe because he was tempted directly by the devil himself. See, some of us think we're being tempted by the devil. You're not being tempted by the devil. You're being tempted by the devil's third cousin, fourth cousin, brother-in-law. We're not being tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted directly by the devil, right? 
And we do contend though with other demons. We contend with other evil spirits fighting us and influencing us. All right. But here's the thing. Jesus' temptation was so severe because he never yielded. Let me say that again. He never yielded. He never gave in. He never threw in the towel. That made his temptation more severe because how many of you know that there's a sense of relief that comes along with giving in to temptation? Oh, come on now. Tell the truth and shame the devil. The devil fights you and fights you and fights you. You resist the devil. You resist the devil. You resist the devil. There's temptation, but then all of a sudden you give in and it's like there's a relief that comes with that. Now, soon thereafter comes condemn, condemnation. Yes, 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 yes. But remember, temptation is not the problem. Yielding to temptation is the problem. It brings condemnation, yielding to temptation. So we're not going to talk about all of the various temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness. Okay. We're not going to do that. Um, so we, so we've, We've talked about uh, Jesus' tempta being tempted. Now, now that we've talked about Jesus being tempted, let me talk about the second uh, area in chapter 4 that you need to understand. We now need to talk about rejection. Hmm. If you're like me, you can raise your hand. You've been rejected so many times, it's almost become second nature, right? We understand what it's like to be rejected. In fact, most people fear rejection. So we avoid attempting a lot of things because we fear the consequence of rejection. Okay, so let's talk about rejection. I want to take you to the 12th verse of the fourth chapter. And it reads, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtalim. Excuse me. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, verse 16, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Light is sprung up. Now, all right, I wanted you to see this because I noticed that in verse, um, in verse 13, it says, and leaving Nazareth. Verse 13 says, and leaving Nazareth. So we know that Jesus was in Nazareth, right? That's where he was brought up. But then he moved to Capernaum. Okay. Not only did he move to Capernaum, but you need to know that he set up his ministry headquarters where? In Capernaum, in Capernaum. But the interesting thing is Jesus was raised in Nazareth and his friends were where? In Nazareth and his family was in Nazareth and his synagogue was in Nazareth. His rabbi was in Nazareth. Why would he move to Capernaum? Hmm. I don't know about you, but I would think that you'd want to start your ministry where you have the most support. I would think that you'd want to start your ministry where you have the most resources, the most opportunities. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. So, so consider this. Just consider this. I want you to consider that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Christ, right? I want you to consider that maybe the reason he moved to Capernaum was because he didn't have the support in Nazareth. He, he didn't have the opportunities in Nazareth. He didn't have the resources in Nazareth, not the ones that we think he would have had. And I submit to you that Jesus left Nazareth out of necessity. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He left Nazareth out of necessity because Jesus was rejected in Nazareth. They didn't want him in Nazareth. No, ma'am. No, sir. You say, oh, Pastor Rob, this cannot be true. Okay, we'll turn to Luke, the fourth chapter and the 16th verse. Luke 4 and 16 says this. And he came to Nazareth, 
where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He goes into the church on the Sabbath day, and it says, and he stood up for to read. He stood up to read. He then reads this passage, verse 18. He reads this passage. He's actually reading from the book of Isaiah from the Old Testament, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Mm. Then, then really it goes on in verse 20 and 21 and I'll just paraphrase it for you but it goes on and it says that after he finished he closed the book and sat down you know sometimes it's good to know when to stop talking he closed the book and sat down and then it says everybody in the synagogue just stared at him they just big eyed they just they just stared at him and they couldn't believe what they were hearing and then Jesus says to them this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. <laughs> now you would think that they would all stand up and begin to cheer and begin to clap because the Messiah is on the scene. You would think now they could see that their deliverance was nigh and that salvation was at their doorstep. But they didn't. No. The only thing they had to say to Jesus and I don't even think they spoke this to him. The only thing they said was, wait a minute, isn't this Joseph's son? We know Mary, we know Joseph. This isn't the son of God. This isn't the Messiah. This isn't who Isaiah spoke about. Isn't that just like people to doubt who God has called you to be because of who they know you were? It's just like people. That's what they said to him. Now, keep in mind, Jesus was disappointed, but he was not surprised. And I want to encourage all of you out there. Sometimes when people don't believe in you, it's okay to be disappointed, but don't be surprised. If they didn't believe in Jesus, they may not believe in you. If they rejected Jesus, they will reject you. And if they persecuted Jesus, guess what? They will persecute you. Jesus said, the world hated me, and they will hate you. That's what Jesus said. That's not Pastor Rob. That's what Jesus said. Now, look at verse 24, Luke 4 and 24. It says, or Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted where? In his own country. In his own country. Then he goes on, he says a few more words, and, and, and eventually he he, it says in everybody in the synagogue, it says they were filled with wrath. Verse 28, they were filled, they were mad at him for what he said. They stood up. It says they thrust him out of the city. They kicked him out. They led him unto the brow of the hill. Verse 29, they led him to the brow, the edge of the hill where the city was built so that they could throw him off the side headlong, head first. They were going to murder Jesus because he said that he was the son of God. Mm. But the Bible says miraculously that Jesus kind of passed through the midst of them. And then it says, and he came down to Capernaum. <laughs> Listen to me. Do you now understand why Jesus ended up in Capernaum and did not start his ministry in Nazareth? It was because of one word, rejection. Oh, my God. Listen, sometimes God has to let you be rejected in one place so he can get you to another place. Sometimes he has to let you be turned away from one thing so he can get you over to another thing. Rejection. And, and I want to tell you, <laughs> when Jesus gets down, uh, gets down to Nazareth, you know the people, I'm sorry, when he gets down to Capernaum, you know the people probably asked him, hey, where, where are you from? I thought you were from Nazareth. The, why didn't you start your ministry in Nazareth? Where, where's your family? Where are your supporters? Why aren't they supporting you? And I would, I would imagine that Jesus probably answered and said something like, 
Oh, brother, it's a long story, but God is still good. <laughs> Some of us need to learn that answer. It's a long story, but God is still good. How many of you know uh, what it means to have a long story, but then you just keep it moving, right? You've got a past, but sometimes you just have to keep it what? Sometimes you have to keep it moving. Now, here's what I notice about Jesus keeping it moving. The Bible says when he arrives in Capernaum, it says the first thing he does is start teaching and preaching in the synagogues. That's what he does. He starts teaching and preaching the gospel. He didn't get there and start complaining about how the people back in Nazareth rejected him, how, how they didn't agree with him and how they would support my ministry. He didn't whine and complain. Jesus, Jesus could have easily, easily been bitter against his, the people of his own hometown. Don't you think? Oh, yes. He could have easily been bitter against them. And I'm sure the devil tried to tempt him to put a root of bitterness in his heart. And he probably tempted Jesus to curse that city. Just curse it. Right. Do you know why I know this? Because I'm a man. I'm a human being. And that's what the enemy does to many of us. He puts it in our mind and and, and, and you know, he did it to, to two of the disciples. They wanted to call down fire on one city. So I, I just know that that most of us would have gotten gotten to Nazareth and we would have said the first first person that came to us and said, hey, why didn't you start your ministry in in Nazareth? We would have gotten to Capernaum. And the first person who said, why didn't you start your ministry in Nazareth? We would have said. You wouldn't believe how they treated me. Come on, let's go to breakfast. Let me tell you all about it. You wouldn't believe they wouldn't support me. My own family wouldn't support me. Oh, my God. And then we would have prayed a prayer. We would have said, Lord, dry up their harvest. Lord, we let their land be barren. And, and we would have just cast a curse on them. And then we would have had the audacity to say, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right. I'm telling you. Oh, come on, y'all. Let's just tell the truth and shame the devil. That's how we can be. That's how we can be. But listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus wasn't going to let the unbelief of one group affect his ministry to another group. Did you hear what I said? He wasn't going to let the, the, the unbelief of his family and friends affect his ministry to, his, to the complete strangers that would be saved. Not Jesus. And I encourage you, do not let the discouragement, do not let the unbelief, do not let the abandonment that you experience from one group affect your ministry to another group. You've got to learn to move on, move on. Don't dwell on the past. Let old things be passed away. Do you know what you have to learn to do? You have to learn, learn to move on in spite of. Mm hmm. All right. All right. So Jesus was rejected. Amen. Somebody say rejected. Jesus was rejected by his own people. And more than that, he was rejected by his own family. His own family didn't believe in him. Look at John seven and five. It says, for neither did his brethren believe in him, his own family. Listen, sometimes your family are the hardest people to get saved. And if you have saved loved ones, saved siblings, saved parents, praise the name of Jesus for that. Amen. Because many are not so fortunate. All right. So so Jesus, OK, we see that the son of God, he experiences temptation. So he experiences temptation all in chapter four. He experiences rejection all in chapter four. But one thing to consider is that uh, the writer Matthew he may have been particularly interested in Capernaum because Matthew himself was from, guess where? From Capernaum. Did you know that the Apostle Peter was also from Capernaum? So, so the fact that Matthew was from Capernaum meant that there, there, may have been, there may have been some support for Jesus's ministry in Capernaum because Matthew was one of Jesus's disciples. Matthew probably solicited his family and friends. Uh, Matthew probably had some resources Right. Matthew probably knew some people who could allow them to use space for for uh, teaching and preaching. Matthew probably knew some people that owned some fields where they could have revivals. So there were there were there were some areas where there was some support, where there was some support. 
Isn't it amazing how many, how that many times God will send us help and it never comes from the direction or it doesn't come from the direction that we anticipated, right? We, we, we think we're going to get it from this side, but God sends it from that side. We're, we're discouraged over here, but then we're encouraged over here. And, and then sometimes it doesn't even come from the people we would expect it to come from or in the way that we would expect it to come. So listen, the next time, the next time, the next time you ask God for help, don't limit him by telling him where the help must come from. Amen. Let him send it uh, from wherever he wants, because the Bible says that he will send you help from the sanctuary. Amen. Doesn't he own the cattle on a thousand hills? Oh, yes. Didn't he put the stars in the sky? Oh, yes. He can use anybody he wants to help you. He can use anybody he wants to bless you and he can use anybody he wants to make a way for you. So don't close doors that he's opening. All right. And, and just because you've been rejected in one place does not mean you won't be accepted in another. Hmm. We could close Bible study right there. Right. That somebody right there needed to hear that. So you can start your own Bible study so that you can start a small group. Let me keep moving so we can get so we can finish. So we've experienced temptation, right? We've now, when I say we, Jesus has experienced temptation in Matthew 4. Jesus has experienced rejection in Matthew 4. Now Jesus preaches. Now the next thing I want you to see is Jesus preaches in Capernaum, all right? Jesus continues to do what God called him to do. Look at Matthew, the fourth chapter and the 17th verse. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, here it is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? Is at hand. You've heard that before. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice what verse 17 says, though. From that time, Jesus began to preach. And, and here's what I would argue with, with anyone. I would argue that this was Jesus's main occupation. You say what? preaching and teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe Jesus was a preacher first before anything else, albeit he was a preacher who also healed and ministered to many, right? But on the whole, it seems pretty fair to say that Jesus was a preacher and teacher who healed more than to say that he was a healer who preached and taught. Does it, is that fair? All right. I think that's fair. In fact, not only is it fair, Matthew 4 and 23 proves it. Matthew 4 and 23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, teaching in their synagogues and doing what? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then lastly, it says, and healing all manner of sicknesses of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. OK. All right. There you have it. OK. So, yes. Uh, let me let me try to see where we are right now. Number one, what did Jesus experience in Matthew four? The first thing he experienced was what? Temptation, temptation. Number two, Jesus experiences rejection. But even after both of those difficult things, Jesus preaches at Capernaum. Amen. Now, so what I would encourage you about that is whatever God has called you to do, do that. And don't forget what your first vocation is. Amen. Yes, you may be uh, uh, an engineer. Yes, you may be a plumber. Yes, you may be an electrician. But if God called you to be a teacher, if he called you to 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 be a, a prophet, if he called you to be an evangelist, do your first vocation. Amen. Now, um, so now, so let's see, temptation, rejection, Jesus preaches in Capernaum. And the last point I want to show you tonight is Jesus experienced fame. Let's talk about the fact that Jesus experienced fame. Matthew 4 and 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness all manner of disease among the people and his here it is and his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought him 
And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he what? He healed them and there followed him. There's another word I want you to notice. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Listen, Christ's fame, Christ's fame spread far and wide, right? And, and of course it was because of the deeds he did. It was because of the miracles that he wrought. Can you imagine if somebody were to come to town and begin to heal broken bones in front of your eyes? I want you to know this still does yet happen in the world, right? You just need a preacher with faith and you need some people with some faith, amen. And so imagine how many people would flock to that place to be prayed for by that preacher, by that evangelist, amen. So people followed him from all over and people from all of these areas, Judea, um, Galilee, Jerusalem, they followed Jesus. He, he had become famous in his time, right? The Bible said his fame spread abroad. Um, and despite the arguments, um, despite the despite contrary arguments that follow does not necessarily indicate strong discipleship you know what i mean just because somebody is following you doesn't mean they're they're your disciple and i agree with that just because somebody says that they follow you or they're on your team doesn't mean they're loyal to you or that they are strong disciples in christ just because a person attends church doesn't make them a strong disciple but nevertheless the Bible says all of these people were following Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're always going to have those that follow for the fishes and the loaves, for the blessings that come as a, as a um, consequence of being a part of that ministry. But the Bible says, hey, the wheat and the tare must grow together. Amen. And so, um, so, so there were probably some people who were loosely considered disciples. Okay. All right, loosely, but, but we have the, those today too. All right. Uh, nevertheless, it's pretty clear that because of the miracle working power of Jesus, many people followed Christ. Many, many, many people followed Christ. Some followed him closer than others, but, but, if we allow, but if we will allow the power of God to just be displayed in our lives, can you imagine how many people would follow Jesus? If we allow the power of God to be displayed in our churches, can you imagine how many more people would follow Jesus? And, and, and yes, some would follow him closer than others. I understand that. But many will follow Jesus. Amen. Let's summarize our Bible study tonight. I didn't want to hold you long tonight. Number one, we know that uh, temptation is not the problem. Temptation is not the problem. Jesus experiences temptation himself. But the blessing is this, you know that if Jesus was tempted, you and I are going to be tempted. But Jesus's temptation was greater because Jesus never yielded. He never committed sin. So his temptation was greater. Then we know that Jesus experienced rejection. And he experienced that at Nazareth in his hometown, in his home city, from people that he was very familiar with and even from his own family. His own brothers didn't believe in him, right? But Jesus was disappointed, but he wasn't surprised. You should be, you are allowed to be disappointed, but please don't be surprised if people reject you, okay? And Jesus wasn't going to let the unbelief of one group of people affect his ministry to another group of people, and neither can we do that. Then thirdly, we saw that Jesus goes and he immediately starts preaching in Capernaum. Jesus just simply moves on. He doesn't whine, complain, and murmur about what the people in Capernaum did to him or said about him or try, they tried to kill him. He simply starts preaching. He moves on. And because Jesus was a preacher and teacher, even more than he was a healer who happened to preach. Okay. Yes. And last but not least, we see that Jesus is preaching. He's teaching. He's healing the sick in Galilee and he becomes famous. His fame spreads abroad throughout all Syria is what it says. 
And, and keep in mind, the, his fame all stemmed from number one, having been anointed after being baptized in water. Number two, after he was baptized in water, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Then, when he, after he comes out of the wilderness, he experiences rejection. He experienced rejection and he had to obey God anyway and do God's will. That's what we have to do. And then last but not least, because he obeyed God, this led to God's approval and God began to use him to work miracles, signs, and wonders. And I will tell you that the same things can happen for you and I. If we would just uh, allow God um, to take us through some temptation, if we would refuse to yield, if we would accept rejection, but keep it moving, keep it moving, then if we would just, just fulfill our vocation, preaching and teaching and, and sharing the gospel, then the Lord would allow us to have a good name. I'm not going to say we'll become famous. That's not our desire or our goal. But we do want the works of Christ to be known all throughout our community and possibly throughout the world. Amen. Amen. Temptation is not the problem. Amen. It's yielding to temptation. That's the problem. All right, everybody. Uh, uh, that's our that's our Bible study for today. I pray that you were blessed. I pray that you received something in the spirit. Please continue to do your homework. Read several chapters ahead. I will continue to preach and teach out of the book of Matthew. And if you're blessed, I, I want you to continue to comment in the comment section below. Hit the like and subscribe buttons, all of those things. But we just thank you for, for joining us tonight at Harvest. I want to pray for you before we go. Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We glorify your name. We bless your name, Jesus. We lift your name above, on high, Lord. You, Father, you said, Jesus, you said, if you be lifted up, you would draw all men nigh. Lord, as we accept this teaching, as we learn to accept and pass our temptations, as we learn, Lord, to accept rejection, as we learn to put the past behind us and not uh, murmur about what people have done to us, please anoint us. Please use us. Use us to start a Bible study, a small group. Use us, Lord, to, to witness to our co-worker. Use us, those of us who are listening, use us, Lord, to witness to our family members that some would become followers of Christ and come into your kingdom. Father, use us. We know that temptation is not the problem. Help us not to yield to temptation. We give you glory tonight and we give you praise. We're praying for all the situations that are going on in the world today. We're praying, Lord, uh, for, for the, the, the wars that are taking place in the, world. We're in the world. We pray that you would keep people safe, Lord, uh, out of harm and danger. Lord, we pray that justice would be done in the name of Jesus. Touch and heal and deliver. And Lord, let your son Jesus be glorified in the name of Jesus. We give you glory and honor. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Harvest at Home. Join us this Sunday, please, at 930 for Christian Education. You're welcome to come in person. We're going to be blessed in our teaching by Minister Steve Hill. Please join us uh, for Sunday morning service at 11 a.m. In-person service again. We will be worshiping and we'll be, we will hear the word of God out of the book of Matthew. You will be blessed. We look forward to seeing you soon. May God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Amen.